and let's listen in for a little bit. I guess most of you do, right? And then we spent a lot of money on making it just perfecto, and now it's doing great. But I don't care about that stuff anymore. That's like small potatoes, right? I'll let my kids run it, have fun with it, and let my executives have a good time. But I, I don't care about it. I care about making America great again. That's what I care about. Okay. And, and we can do it. You know, I, I go all over the world, and I, I see different things in different countries, and I meet different people. And honestly, there's nothing like what we have. You come back, and there's nothing like what we have. And we go to Dallas, and we had 21,000 people. In Oklahoma, we had 20,000 people twice. And we have the biggest crowds, no matter where we go. We uh, were in Tampa a couple of weeks ago, and just a couple of days' notice, we filled up a stadium. It was packed. And uh, no matter where it is, it's been amazing. And I have to tell you, South Carolina is some great place. I love it. I've been here so many. I love it. I love it. And, you know, we have a big, big deal coming up on Saturday, so we have to go out there. New Hampshire treated me so incredibly well, and uh, so did Iowa, actually. I mean, we did really well there, but we did just incredible in New Hampshire. We won every category. Uh, rich, poor, fat, thin, <laughs> everyone. Tall, short. We won every category. We won uh, highly educated and not so well educated. And we, were, we were just rocking. And, uh, I guess we got 36 percent, and that was with a lot of people. So it was a big — we win by 20 points. So it was a great, a great week that I spent there, and I've spent a lot of time here now, and I'll be staying here until Sunday morning, and hopefully we'll be celebrating together on uh, Saturday evening. And uh, that's, that's where we were. I mean, the big thing is so, so, so important. Get out and vote. You know, I'm self-funding my campaign. You people are all rich. You're probably saying, why is he doing that? Why? But, but I'm self-funding my campaign, putting up my own money, and, uh, and it's expensive. I mean, it's expensive. I'm proud of the fact that I have — I'm spending less money than these other characters. You know, they're politicians. All they know how to do is spend. I mean, you know, Jeb Bush in, uh, in New Hampshire, Jeb Bush spent $48 million. I spent three. He was, like, at the bottom of the pack, and I was number one by a landslide. Isn't that what you want for your country, right? Isn't that what you want? I mean, these guys are spending money, the money they have for the commercials. I see commercial after commercial. And, you know, I, I put some — I look, I put some commercials on. You know why? Because I felt guilty. I really felt guilty. Because the press — look at all these guys back there. The press is saying, well, maybe he's not spending for commercials. Why isn't he spending? And, you know, you're leading and you're leading. A great poll just came out about an hour ago. CBS New York Times came out. National poll was great. Uh, we had a total ridiculous poll come out yesterday. Did you see that? Wall Street Journal. Let me tell you. I'll tell you something. That poll was so different than every other poll. And some of the people, the broadcasters, looked at it and said, this doesn't make sense. This is no good. About a month ago, I had a pretty good poll. I never get treated well in the Wall Street Journal in any capacity, okay? But I had a pretty good poll. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. They want — they're weak on immigration. I agree with you. They're weak on a lot of things. They're weak on financial. But the Wall Street Journal did a poll last uh, month, and I was leading by quite a bit. Not as good as other polls, because it's never good, but, but I was leading. I couldn't find it in the paper, right? I couldn't find it. And I literally, I looked all over. I couldn't find it. They had all sorts of other things. Do you love the country? Do you this? Do that? The only thing they didn't do is the main result. But it was in there someplace. I just couldn't find it. It was buried someplace in the back of the paper. Today, they have like an outlier poll. Everybody said a certain broadcaster from NBC who did the poll with them said, I can't go with this poll. This is ridiculous. And they interviewed very few people and very conservative and lots of different criteria, all of which was like — and today it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. What a lot of crap, okay? Isn't it? <laughs> it's disgusting. And I'll tell you, in all fairness to CBS and The New York Times, they knew it was a phony. In my opinion, I have to say that, in my opinion, it's a phony poll. Because USA Today came out, it was phenomenal, 35, 36, 37, I mean, really doing great, uh, and all of them. But in my opinion, that Wall Street Journal poll was a phony poll. I'll tell you that much right now. So we'll see. Um, the New York Times came out just about an hour ago, and it was a phenomenal poll, along with uh, CBS, and so we're really happy. That's nationwide. In South Carolina, we're doing great. I mean, every, every poll shows that we're doing great. So it's been...
But I don't want you to think too much about that because, you know, assume we're tied, okay? Even, why don't we even assume we're losing by just a little bit? Because you have to get out. And, you know, I say to people, I'm self-funding, I'm putting up my own money, but uh, the only thing I want is your vote. I don't want any of your money. You don't have to give me 10 cents. I just want your vote. So if you can remember that, that would be really cool. Um, you know, when this all started, when this all started, this journey, can you imagine any of you people doing this? It's not easy running for president. It's not necessarily fun. You get hit, you get hammered from every corner. You know, you learn things about yourself that you never even thought about. But I will tell you, it's been an amazing experience for me. It's been a really amazing experience. It's been a very interesting experience. It started on June 16th, and I said to my wife, we got to do it. I was watching the Iran deal, where we're giving Iran $150 billion, where we get nothing which is going to lead to nuclear proliferation. And everyone's worried about them building the bomb. Well, they don't have to build it. They can buy it with the money that we gave them. Did you see the money? Did you see the money where it's being spent? They didn't buy the Boeing. They didn't go to Boeing over here. They, be they bought Airbus, 118 Airbus planes. They're spending their money all over Europe. They're buying missiles from Russia. The money that we gave them, they're spending it all over the place. They're spending it everybody with, but with us. We have the hostages. Uh, we essentially paid $150 billion for the four hostages. And all we had to do is four years ago, three years ago, go and say, listen, folks, before we start, very simple, you give us our hostages back. And they'll say no, and you leave the room. And now you ratchet up the sanctions, you double them up. Within, I'm telling you, within two seconds, you'll get a phone call saying, you've got your hostages. And it would have happened. But we had a negotiator, John Kerry, who's in an incompetent negotiator. He's a nice guy. He's an incompetent negotiator. Never left the table once. Never left the table when we were being ridiculed all over the world. When we were being ridiculed in Iran, when they're dancing in the streets saying that we have stupid people representing us, saying that we're all stupid because of the deal. They can't believe it. The people of Iran, I don't know if it was a setup or not, but everyone, they're dancing all over the place. This is before the deal's done. Who would make a deal after you see that, right? They're burning the American flag. Obama is calling the head the supreme leader. We have spoken today to the supreme leader. I'm not calling him supreme leader, folks. I can't guarantee you. That. Not the supreme. He's not my supreme leader. And so, I mean, you know, what, what just, it was so discouraging. When you look at what's happening with trade, the trade is so disastrous. I mean, what's going on with every country, no matter which country you talk about, every single country, what's going on. Mexico is the new China. And, I mean, I just had word, as an example, the Pope. The Pope was in Mexico. Do you know that? Did everyone know, right? He said negative things about me because the Mexican government convinced him that Trump is not a good guy because I want to have a strong border. I want to stop illegal immigration. I want to stop people from being killed, like Kate in San Francisco, like Jamil in Los Angeles, like the incredible woman veteran, 65 years old, who's raped, sodomized, and killed by an illegal immigrant, okay? So the Mexican government fed the Pope a tremendous amount of stuff about Trump is not a good person, and the Pope just made a statement. Can you imagine? I just got a call. As I'm walking up here, they said, Mr. Trump, the Pope made a statement about you. I said, the Pope? <laughs> what did the Pope say? I like the Pope. I mean, was it good or bad? Because if it's good, I like the Pope. If it's bad, I don't like the Pope. No, it's true. Well, you know, look, look. Mexico, I'm wise to Mexico. And I like Mexico. I have no problem. I have Thousands and thousands of people over the years have worked for me. From Mexico, Hispanics work for me. In Nevada, I'm leading with Hispanics. I'm leading the polls. I'm going to bring jobs back to the country. They like me. I have thousands of people that have worked for me, Hispanics, over the years. And I have great relationships with Hispanics. And I've been telling people I'm going to win. And people are saying, you must be kidding. Like, for instance, right here, came out two minutes ago, uh, veterans, right here, in your incredible state, right? The veterans have just, I've gone up eight points because of what I said. You know what they said two days ago, what I said about Iraq, about the World Trade Center. I mean, I only tell the truth. Somebody said, did you poll it? One of the politicians, did you poll? I said, I don't poll what I say. I say what's right. I say what's on my mind. And if it doesn't work, it's fine. I mean, you know, that's okay, but it's, it's, it's not a question of working. I have to be honest. But in South Carolina, they just did a poll. I went up 8% with the vets. Now it's supposed to be, boom. The vets get it. 
In fact, we have one of the great vets here, ever, right here, Al. Al, they're liking me. What happened? What happened? I went up. I was supposed to go down. I love the vets. I do more for the vets than any. These politicians don't do anything for the vets. They talk. So what happened? I went up in the poll. You went up in the polls because when you sent me over to VA to check on the veterans, they right. love you. Oh, that's very nice. Wow. <laughs> See, who knew that was going to happen? You know, they say Trump will say things that we think he's going to go down, and he goes up. And they say, you know why? Because people like honesty when you think about it. But that was great. So I guess this is a little bit for the press. So I just wrote this out very quickly about the Pope. Do you want to hear it? Should I read it to you? Okay. He actually said that maybe I'm not a good Christian or something. It's unbelievable, which is really not a nice thing to say. So it's a response from Donald Trump. It says, if and when the Vatican is attacked by ISIS. You know, ISIS, their primary trophy, very few people know this. I read this about two months ago. Nobody even believed it. Their primary thing, you've seen what they've done all over the Middle East. Their primary goal is to get to the Vatican. That would be their ultimate trophy. They want to do what they did to all of these magnificent artifacts and all of the beautiful museums that they've totally destroyed all over the Middle East, right? They're, and I didn't know this. I read this like four or five months ago. I made mention of it two months ago, and everyone said, what are you talking about? They thought, like, I'm kidding. It's true. And now there are stories about it, not big stories, but there are stories about it. And I was checked by one of the reporters that said, they don't want to talk about the." Then he called up and apologized. The big thing, they want to get to the Vatican. So if and when the Vatican is attacked by ISIS, which, as everyone knows, is ISIS's ultimate trophy, I can promise you that the Pope would have only wished and prayed that Donald Trump would have been president. Because it's true. It's true. Because this would not have happened. ISIS would have been eradicated, unlike what is happening now, with our all-talk, no-action politicians. That's what's happening now. We, we, we had a General MacArthur. If we had a General George Patton, I mean, they'd be gone before they even got time to go over and uh, check it out, okay? It's a ridiculous situation. The Mexican government and its leadership has made many disparaging remarks about me. See, the Pope was in Mexico. The leadership's meeting. Oh, Donald Trump is a bad guy. He wants to build a wall. He wants to keep illegal immigration. It's terrible. They don't say it that way. They say, he wants people to stop having this and that. Look, I'm wise to them. I respect Mexico. I respect their leadership. Their leadership is much smarter, much sharper than our leadership. And that's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> You know, we have a trade deficit with Mexico. Listen to this one. $58 billion. So when I say we're going to build a wall and Mexico's going to pay for it, these politicians all come up and they say, you can't get Mexico to pay. I say, yes, I can. They have no idea what I'm even talking about. You people do because you have some business people here, some good business people. Some of them I know. But Mexico's going to pay because the wall is $12 billion, 10 to $12 billion. That's a super job, OK? That's if you do a Trump wall, OK? Real nice job. Nice high wall. <laughs> This is a high night. Nice, this is not a wall that they're going to drive their trucks over. Now, when we have a deficit of 58 billion, 10 to 12 billion is peanuts. Okay, it's peanuts. That's not. That's nothing. So the politicians say, "How could you possibly say that? You know that." Now they're all starting to say, "You know, he's really right. We're losing a lot of money with Mexico, and that's not including the drug money that's pouring across, which is much more." Okay, believe me, we get the drugs, they get the cash. So they met with the Pope. And they obviously got to the Pope, and they're telling him what a bad guy Donald Trump is. He doesn't know me. And, you know, et cetera. So let me, the Mexican government and its leadership has made many disparaging remarks about me to the Pope because they want to continue to rip off the United States, both on trade and at the border. That's what they're doing. They're ripping us off. And they understand that I am totally wise to them. And if I'm president, we'll stop it immediately, okay? Immediately. The Pope only heard one side of the story, and he didn't see the crime, the drug trafficking, and the negative economic impact the current policy — I mean, you see what's going on, right? The current policies have on the United States. So he didn't see the crime, the drug trafficking, the, in, the economic impact is 
is horrendous, all right? People can come into our country, folks, but they have to come in legally. They have to come in through a process. We're like an open gate. People just walk across. They walk into our country. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they've come from. And by the way, speaking of that, the migration, the people from Syria, we don't know. Are they ISIS? Are they not? They're not coming into this country, okay? They can't. He doesn't see how Mexican leadership, and he doesn't understand it, he doesn't see how Mexican leadership is outsmarting our president, and Obama and our leadership has no clue as to the negotiation or anything else. In other words, we are being so badly out-negotiated by Mexico, Mexico knows that if I win, those days are gone. We're not going to have a $58 billion trade deficit. Not going to happen. We're not going to lose carrier, air conditioner, just move to Mexico. You saw that. We're not going to have Nabisco move their big plants to Mexico. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. We're not going to have Ford building so big, two and a half billion dollar plant. And now, I've been talking about that for a year and a half, now they're doubling down. I read the other day in the paper, they're doubling down. Ford is going in much bigger into Mexico. They took a plant from Tennessee that was going to go to Tennessee, and they went, the plant went to Mexico instead. When are we going to get smart, folks? When are we going to get smart? Got to happen. We can't let this stuff go on. Because we're losing our jobs, we're losing everything. The Pope isn't being told that. The Pope is being told that Donald Trump is not a nice person, okay? Donald Trump is a very nice person. And I'm a very, I, I am a very nice person. And I'm a very good Christian, because the Pope said something to the effect that maybe Donald Trump isn't Christian, okay? And He's questioning my faith. I was very surprised to see it, but I am a Christian. I'm proud of it. Okay. For a religious leader to question a person's faith is disgraceful. I'm proud to be a Christian, and as president, I will not allow Christianity to be consistently attacked and weakened, unlike what is happening now with our current president. Okay? <laughs> Believe me. No leader... Very important, and this has just been given out to the press two seconds ago. No leader, especially a religious leader, should have the right to question another man's religion or faith, especially when they feed all sorts of false information into them. They're using the Pope as a pawn, and they should be ashamed of themselves. That's the Mexican government. They should be ashamed of themselves for doing so especially when so many lives are involved and when illegal immigration is so rampant and so dangerous and so bad for the United States, okay? Period. That's it. Period. So, I mean, I come to this beautiful place and I'm looking, I'm looking, everything's so beautiful. The people are beautiful. Everything's nice. And I get hit. The Pope just made a statement. Oh, good. Did he say good things? No, I don't think you're going to like it so much. <laughs> so this is the beginning as I'm walking in, okay? So you are the first to hear it, okay? This is a breaking story, right? Breaking news. So we have to do something about illegal immigration because our country is being decimated. And speaking of Mexico, and again, I have nothing against Mexico. I like Mexico. I have nothing against the leaders of Mexico. I think they're very sharp, very smart, very cunning. They're far too smart for Obama. They're far too smart for our leadership. When you look at Carrier going there, what do we get out of it? Okay, Carrier. So I saw the other day, I guess somebody was using the cell phone camera. I saw the other day the whole speech made by the executive. We are moving to Mexico. Your jobs are gone, blah, 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 right? And it was very sad. People very devastated. You could see they were devastated. They've been working at Carrier for many years. They do a good job. I used to buy Carrier air conditions. I won't buy them anymore. Hopefully, I won't buy them because I'll be president. I won't care about them, right? <laughs> But I buy a lot of air conditioners. I buy a lot of a lot of product. Unfortunately, almost everything you buy now is made. You buy televisions. You go to South Korea. You buy. I mean, do we make anything anymore here? We don't make anything. Yeah, we make good golf resorts for you to live in. <laughs> so what happens is um, Carrie is leaving. Now, what I would do is different. You know, I'm a free trader. I believe in free trade. All these you know conservatives say Hugh's not a conservative because he doesn't believe. I believe in smart trade, folks. They're taking everything we have. China has created the greatest theft. It's the single greatest theft in the history of the world, what they've done to the United States. They've taken millions of jobs. They've taken our money. They've taken our base. They've taken our manufacturing. They've done so much. 
even Boeing, remember this, and I'm saying this to South Carolina, you won't have to worry about it if I'm president, believe me, it's not gonna happen. They're building massive plants. In order to get an airline order, they're building massive plant plants in China. When China devalues their currency in three years from now, or four years from now, and when they announce they're not gonna make planes in South Carolina anymore, because it's much cheaper to make them in China, remember what Donald Trump said. You don't have to remember if I win. You just remember if I don't win for some reason, okay? We remember, we better win. Well, we better win. I hope. I hope so. I hope so, because it's so easy. So carrier, so carrier moves, that's it. They're gonna move. Probably, probably get incentives from our government. You know, there was a time where we were given incentives. You know, I mean, can you believe it? Probably got tax credits for moving out of the country because we are so far behind. So carrier leaves and they go to Mexico. So here's what I do. And I probably, you know, I want to be presidential, so I'm not supposed to make the call myself, right? But I might make it myself anyway. <laughs> you know, Carl Icahn, you know Carl Icahn. Carl Icahn endorsed me, and a lot of the big business people endorsed me. And, uh, you know, Carl said, look, he's the one guy that knows. I mean, I know, I understand corporate inversions, and all, I know, understand what's going on. Trillions of dollars is offshore. It's all over the place, outside of the country. We can't get it back. The companies can't get it back. Some companies are leaving for taxes because we have the highest taxes in the world, but other companies are leaving to get their money. They can't get it back in. They've got money offshore. They've got money in Europe, all over the place. They can't get their money. So I have all of these endorsements. So here's what I do with Carrier, okay? Whether it's me or somebody, because I will use our greatest business leaders, some of whom may be in this room, by the way. I will use our We have the best business people in the world, but we don't use them to negotiate our trade deals. I will be using our best, best, sharpest, killer business people to negotiate with the killers from these other countries. And again, I don't, I think it's great that Mexico's doing this. If you can get away with it, you gotta get away with it. How smart are they? They see the Pope and they tell the Pope bad things about me because I'm against, you know, I'm very, very strong for illegal immigration. Very, we gotta stop it, right? So they tell the Pope, Trump is bad and the Pope says something negative about me. Now it's probably gonna be all over the world. Who the hell cares, okay? I don't care, I don't care. I don't care because we have to stop illegal immigration. We have to stop the massive crime. By the way, we have right now 100, this was as of last week, reported, 179,000 illegal immigrants in our country who are criminals, okay? These are criminal illegal immigrants. We take care of them. We watch them. They commit crimes. You know the cost of this and the devastation to the families? Kate in San Francisco? Jamil, I mean, one of the greatest young men shot in the face. Kate shot in the back in San Francisco by somebody that should have never been here. We are, we are so incompetently run. And then you have sanctuary cities where people can be there and it doesn't matter. I mean, practically they can be whatever they want to be and they get away with it. We have sanctuary cities. Nobody even heard the term. I don't think anybody here did. Did anyone know about sanctuary cities? We had sanctuary cities. We had five or seven in Florida while Bush was governor. It's sanctuary cities. He never told us that. We have, we have a tremendous problem. We have to clean up. We have to be proud of our country again, folks. We have to go back to the basics. We have to be proud of our country again. So, so we're losing our businesses. So I would essentially, whether it's me or one of my people, and I have some tough people, we have to use the right people, but call up carrier. Say, folks, we don't want you to leave. Oh, but we're leaving. We're leaving. Why are you leaving? Because we're getting some good deal or they're getting good financing from somebody in the Mexican government or something. Okay, smart. Mexico should try and get them. But we should try and keep them. So I say, here's the deal. And I'm a free trader, remember that. I don't want, you know, to have lots of, you know, restrictions at the border in terms of trade, et cetera, et cetera. But you gotta have fair trade. You have to have smart trade. So I'd say very simply, I'd say, you know what? Congratulations on leaving. Congratulations on devastating those 1,400 families that have been left behind, that have done a great job, by the way. Good product, done a great job for years. Congratulations, but here's the story. You go to Mexico, every air conditioner that you sell that goes into the United States, we're gonna charge you a 35% tax, okay? Let's see if your numbers still work. And I'd say, let's see if your numbers still work because I'll bet you they don't. And they'll call me and they'll say, oh, Mr. President, but here's the difference. I'm self-funding my own campaign. I'm not getting paid by their lobbyists, by their special interests, by their donors, by their stockholders. 
I'm what I'm doing right for the people. I mean, I speak before thousands and thousands. I'm get, I'm doing what's right for the people. I don't care. I don't need the money. I don't need any money. So I'm I'm doing what's right for this country. Okay, and the politicians can't do that. They can't do that. We have people heading up campaigns that are the heads of the drug industry, as an example. Woody Johnson, Johnson and Johnson, he's heading up. Uh, Bush's fundraising campaign. Did a good job, raised $150 million for a guy that's going nowhere. I mean, you know, when you think of it, <laughs> right? No, he raised $150 million for a guy got, you might as well take it and throw it into the ocean and let the kids collect it. It's got more value. But, but Woody Johnson, Johnson and Johnson. Now, here's a thing that I didn't even know. And a friend of mine found out, the Mar-a-Lago Club. You've heard of the Mar-a-Lago Club. He's a member. He comes up to me, a big doctor. He says, Donald, it's so brutal. Obamacare is such a disaster. I have now more accountants working for me than I have nurses. It's so complicated, it's driving me, he hates it, okay. But he said, do you know, Donald, that the, and he's a smart cookie, he said, do you know that the federal government doesn't negotiate drug purchases? I mean, drugs to make you better, drugs. They don't negotiate, they're prohibited from negotiating. That the United States government pays sort of like if you walk in, if Mrs. Schwartz walks into a drugstore to buy drugs to get better that we pay the same price practically as her. I said, that's no possible, not possible. He said, it is. Then immediately, you know, being the person that I am, I said, oh, it is, of course, because the politicians are all taken care of by the drug companies, and therefore they don't have negotiation, right? That's what it is. There are billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars left out there due to uh, policies. You know, a lot of times when you see, a, you think the politicians are stupid and you think the deals are bad, they're not bad. They're good for them. They're taking care of the lobbyists and the special interests, okay? Because they can't be that bad. You look at some of these deals. Even the Iran deal, I'll bet you there's something involved. I mean, it's hard to believe, but look at these companies in Europe that are making a fortune. Airbus, I'll guarantee you, they have probably lobbyists. They probably knew that some of this money was going to buy 118 Airbus planes. 118 planes, not one Boeing. And Boeing's better. I like it better, too. I have one. But <laughs> Boeing's better. But think of it. 118, they probably knew. They probably had lobbyists for, uh, for Airbus. And they probably had lobbyists for Russia. You know, Russia's selling a missile. So they probably had lobbyists. Everybody has lobbyists. So when you see some of these deals that are so absolutely bad, they are bad. But the reason they're bad isn't stupidity. It's, in a way, dishonesty, OK? It's sort of called legal dishonesty. But in a way, it's dishonesty. And when they go up and they say to one of the people running, like Ted Cruz, he, he's got people, you gotta see some of the people that are giving him money. Forget it, folks, forget it. You got problems. He's taken money from people you won't believe. Check out his list of people. But when they go up to Cruz and they go up to these different people that are running, every single one of them, on both sides, by the way, but on my side, I'm the only one, I'm on both sides, I'm the only one self-funding, period. And I feel sort of foolish. You know, my whole life has been about money, money. I want money. I want money. It's greed. I want money. And now these guys are coming up. They want to give me millions. I have a guy come up to me the other day, Donald, I'll give you whatever you want, millions. Where? How do I? I said, I, I can't take it. You know, it's hard for me to say that because my whole life is it's hard. I feel a little bit like, uh, am I okay? Am I going crazy here? And I say, I don't want it. No. And every time the guy sees me, he's a very rich guy. He said, Don, he doesn't even understand. I said, no, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You know, you don't have to do anything. Don't worry. It's okay. And every time he sees me, like once a month, I see him at, at a club, at the Mar-a-Lago Club. He's a very, very rich guy. And he says, Donald, I, I don't understand. You never got back to me. I said, yeah, I don't really want your money. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And he can't understand it. He can't understand it. But I would have the greatest fund in history if I ever said I'm going to do it. But I will tell you this. I will tell you this. I think it resonates with the voters. I, I, you know, for a while I was saying, I don't think I get any credit. I mean, I'm gonna spend a tremendous amount of money. I've already spent a lot. Even though I've spent less than these people, I've spent a lot, you know, because I'm somebody like you. We watch it, we spend it wisely, we're careful, et cetera, et cetera, but we spent it wisely. And I'd spend as much as I need, but we don't wanna spend it if we don't need it. I mean, I'm looking at some of the money spent, it's incredible, but when they put up their money, to the head of the drug companies and to all of these different, and the drug companies come in and they've got, and I'll tell you something, I know these people. At the last debate, I walked into the room, I looked, I said, oh man, they're all the lobbyists, all the, I know a lot of them. Those are all the special interests. 
I did a really good job at that debate. Everybody, Drudge said I was number one. Time Magazine said I was number one. Every time I said something, there was like, yeah, but every time I said something, there was like dead silence in the room. And I had one friend who's a friend of mine, but he's supporting another candidate because he wants, he knows he can get something. He can't get anything from me. He said, you're the last person I'll ever support. He actually told me that. But he's a lobbyist and he, he's supporting it. And he starts booing me and he's laughing and booing and waving to me. Okay? And I'm sort of like waving to him because I understand. I mean, I get it. I had another guy come in, Don, I want to give you a lot of money for your campaign. You know, it's funny, I've been number one from just about the beginning, from June 16th. Every, since they really thought I was doing it. And other than the uh, Wall Street Journal today, which uh, we'll have to call them up and find out what was going on there, you know, that phony deal. But I've been number one, like, right from the beginning. I don't like, I don't like dishonesty. I, tell you, I don't like dishonesty, and I think it's dishonest, but who knows. But I've been number one just about from the beginning. And when you're number one in this business, in this crazy business of politics, you, the money is just, it's unbelievable. It just pours in. It's just like crazy. I never saw anything like it. It's better than being on The Apprentice. It's the most, <laughs> no, it's the most, when you have, when you are number one in the polls, people come that you never even heard of. Donald, I'd like you to, to speak to the head of these massive companies that, you know, they'd like to come in, they'd like to have lunch. Okay, so I don't even have lunch because I don't want to turn them down. I don't even want to be tempted. You understand that, right? But when you have this kind of stuff come in, and they, I said to this one man, he comes into my office, I want to give you $10 million for your campaign. I said, that's a lot of money, but I can't take it because I'm self-funding my campaign. He goes like, what? He, he didn't even, he thought I maybe didn't hear much. So then he goes again, and I said, no, I don't want it. I said, why? I said, because I'm self-funding my campaign. It's a really big part of my campaign. I think it means something, although I must tell you, I'm not sure it means as much as it is actually costing. I don't know. I don't think people are going into the voters will say, I'm voting for Trump. Let's see, it's Trump and this guy. I'm going to go with Trump because he's self-funding. I don't know that it has that big of an impact, but I hope it does. Because believe me, believe me, this isn't about me. This is, this is an important thing. This is an important thing. So, Anyway, the guy goes, and I say, I don't want it. And he's sort of a friend of mine, and he's leaving the office. I say, just out of curiosity, so what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to support somebody else. I said, why? Why? You could support me, but I just don't want your money. I can't take any money. I don't want your money. He goes, no, no, I have to support somebody else. He said, I, I love the game. They're gamblers. They're gamblers. They want to put up money. He'd rather give somebody $10 million or $5 million or $2 million than give somebody nothing. Okay? It's crazy. They're like horse players. These are the people. I know them. They, I mean, I know them. Don't forget, before June 16th, I was a very big contributor. I was, I was like a member of the establishment. The day I ran, boy, did I become anti-establishment fast, okay? <laughs> and the politicians are going crazy, and the head of the RNC and all these people are going crazy because, you know, they're not going to have... I'm going to do what's right for the country. I'm not going to do what's right for the politicians. I'm not going to do what's right for these special <laughs> info. And, and honestly, I've never talked about this subject so long, but I mean, this is a group that really gets it. I mean, you understand it. And probably some of the people in this room won't be very happy with what I'm saying because they want to have their certain thing. You probably have a couple of lobbyists in this room. I know most of them, let me see. But one of the things, one of the things, and I started by telling you about pharmaceuticals and the drug companies. Now, when you think about it, okay, when you think about it, you can take that one group and bid it out. And even if you don't per se bid it, if you went with a favored nations clause, because in a way bidding is a little bit, you know, I almost don't trust anybody to bid, you know? All of a sudden they move into a beautiful house in the Hamptons or in Palm Beach, and you say, gee, I thought they were civil servants, and now they're moving to Palm Beach. What happened? But you do a favored nations clause. So with the drug companies, we get the lowest price that you've negotiated over the last 12 month period immediately inures to the United States of America, less 10% because we're a big, big, big buyer. So we would get the lowest price. I like that better than having a negotiation. In other words, now everybody else negotiates. Whatever the lowest price that they've made for a certain product, we get the lowest price, and then I take a discount beyond that. And you know what? We'd save hundreds of billions of dollars. Defense industry, same thing. M much more so, though, I would say. For 25 years, ever since I'm sort of like where I'm really interested in this stuff, I've been watching as they're ordering equipment and they're ordering things that they don't want. You know, you've been seeing the story of the airplane that 
they didn't like as much as the other one, that they're getting equipment that they don't need, that they don't want. Well, the reason is because those companies that make the equipment are politically astute. They have taken care of these people that I'm with. They have taken care of lots of other people that I'm not with. And they order equipment that they don't want. I'm going to make our military so strong, so powerful, you have no idea what we're going to do because we have the technology. But, <laughs> but we're going to do it for a lot less than anybody thought possible. And we're going to get the equipment that the generals want and the soldiers want and all of the people want that are running the equipment. We're not going to get equipment that, you know, and I've seen it. The airplane, oh, well, we didn't really want this airplane. We wanted the other one, but we got it. You know, the politicians are making the decisions, okay? We're going to get the best stuff. We're going to be so strong. Nobody's going to play games with us, folks. Nobody. We're going to get the best stuff. There'll be nothing like it, what we can do. And we're going to save a fortune. We're going to save a fortune. So with the military, that happens. I tell you about the pharmaceutical stuff. We're going out to bid, okay? Save hundreds of billions of dollars. With the military, you're talking about much bigger numbers than that, but we'll have a much better. Somebody would say, will it be better or not? I remember the United Nations, right? So I testified in front of a great group of senators, actually, who uh, were terrific. Uh, in fact, your senator from Oklahoma, who just said horrible things. He said, Ted Cruz is the most dishonorable, dishonest person I've ever met. What he said is humble. He cannot stand him. But they asked me to testify in Congress about the World Trade Center, about the World Trade Center, but also mostly about uh, the United Nations. Because they were doing a renovation of the United Nations, and they said, we would like to understand this. You built a building across the street that's 92 stories tall. We are renovating the United Nations, and we're going to spend $1 billion. I said, no, you're not. You're going to spend $4 billion, because by the time they kill you with the overruns, you will spend $4 billion. No, 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 it's $1 billion. Okay. How much did you spend? So there was a story in the New York Times that said, I built the building for $322 million. 92 stories, condo, Trump World Tower. Beautiful building right opposite the United Nations. That was 322, about $320 million, right? Now, they're going to renovate the United Nations, which is a much, you know, which is not a big deal, and they're going to spend a billion. So an ambassador from, I think it was Sweden, called up, Mr. Trump, could I meet you? Why? I'm on a committee. We don't understand how can you spend $320 million and build this incredible building, brand new, beautiful, and yet we're spending a billion dollars to just fix up the United Nations. I said, because of two reasons, corruption, and incompetence. It's very simple. Oh, it's true. So this man, I think he was the ambassador to Sweden. It was a while ago, five years, six years. This, this man is a terrific guy. He said, I'd like to go public, and I'd like to this. Could you meet the head of the United Nations? I met the head of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, at that time. I met him, and he had no interest in my thing. All he wanted was a press. In fact, I'm sitting there in a chair, and there's a big curtain, sort of like this. And I didn't know what was going on. And all of a sudden, the curtain opens, and there was so much press, and they're taking pictures. That's all he wanted. He didn't care about the cost of this thing. So what happened is they brought in the man that's in charge of it. So I said, are you using a boiler system? Are you using New York steam? What are you using for heat? He said, I have no idea. He had no idea. He didn't know boilers. He didn't know anything. This guy knew nothing. He was in charge of construction. So they were at a billion dollars. I said, this is not going to cost a billion. This is going to cost four or five billion, which turned out to be exactly true. It cost a fortune, OK? So I offered to do the job for $500 million. I said, I will do the job sight unseen. They say, well, what's the difference? I said, here's the difference. The difference is you'll have a much better job for $500 million than you have for, in my, I actually predicted it would cost $4 billion if they do it themselves, because well, you have people out there that you don't even know about, you won't ever read about that. They're really, really rich, just so you understand. Real, they could move to Kiowa very easily, believe me. <laughs> you got some rich people out there. But I said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have a tremendous cost overrun that happened. You have people that don't know what they're doing, but they probably do know what they're doing very well. And, but they said to me, What's the difference? The difference is, I'll have marble floor, they'll have terraza. I'll have better elevators, they won't. With me, you don't have to move out, they're going to have to move out. Under their scenario, everybody had to leave the United Nations, rent office space, big trouble, hard to get a Manhattan, and then come back. I was going to do it, everybody in place, right? Everything was better, and I never heard from them. I never heard from them. And then the le next time I heard was a few years later when the thing was totally out of control and it's cost a fortune and all that. Well, the same thing is true with our country. Our country, we will spend less money, 
but we'll have better roads, better airports. You know, our infrastructure is a disaster. We spent in Iraq, which was a horrible decision to go into Iraq. Okay, you know that. I mean, I hope you know that. And I should get points for vision because I said right at the beginning, don't go into Iraq, you're going to destabilize the Middle East. We spent $2 trillion in Iraq, and now it's much more than that. But $2 trillion, that was a, as of two years ago. Thousands of lives, wounded warriors who I love all over the place, okay? We have nothing. We have nothing. We have to start rebuilding our country. We've got to knock the hell out of ISIS and knock them out and knock them out like you've never seen anybody get knocked out. But we have to get back to rebuilding our country. Our country is a mess. Our roads, our bridges. You know, 40% of our bridges are in danger. I mean, you know what danger means. Danger means like you go over and you've seen collapses of bridges. We have tremendous infrastructure problems. And by the way, wouldn't it be great to have a great builder in charge of like a country that has to spend billions and billions and trillions on infrastructure? Because I am. I mean, what I do, you know, I'm, I'm building the old post office on Pennsylvania Avenue, and we're way ahead of schedule and under budget. We're two years ahead of schedule. I actually said to my daughter, let's not say two years, because it doesn't even sound believable. But we're actually two years under schedule, ahead of schedule, and under budget. And it's right on Pennsylvania Avenue. And I like it because this way, if I don't make the White House, I'll still be living on Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. 100%. But we're under budget, ahead of schedule. It's going to open up September of this year. It was supposed to open September in two years from now. And it's going to be one of the great hotels of the world. Maximum job. Unbelievable. It's going to be one of the great hotels of the world. That's what we need. That's the thinking we need in this country. That's the thinking we need in this country. So I tell the people, I say, well, what would be the difference like with the military? I say, here's the story. We'll spend less money. We'll have much better equipment. We'll have much happier people. Everybody's going to love it. We're going to be stronger, better, just like the story with the United Nations. What's the difference? Four billion versus 500 million. Well, the 500 million, the United Nations will have marble floors instead of, frankly, parquet. <laughs> but, but they'll have marble floors. They'll have everything will be the best. Same thing with us. We can do that. I mean, we can do that. We have the wrong systems in place. We have tremendous corruption. We have tremendous, tremendous corruption. You look at what's going on in the Veterans Administration. It's one of the most corrupt enterprises that I've ever seen, okay? We can straighten it out. We're going to make — that's why Al is one of the most respected vets in the country. And he was up in New Hampshire, and we got tremendous support up in New Hampshire for the vets. I mean, beyond what anybody even came close. But. They have confidence in me. We've got to take care of the vets. Our vets are being decimated. Our vets are being treated worse than illegal immigrants in many cases. It's true. It's true. They get things. They get things that our vets, that our vets can't even think about getting. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. I mean, think of yourselves. They go to doctor's offices. They have four-day and five-day waits before they can even see a doctor in some cases. Four. Can you imagine you, you, go into a doctor's office and they'll say, you have a five-day wait. That doctor's in trouble. Is that a correct statement? I mean, you know, as an example. So we've got to take care of our vets. We've got to take care of our military. We're going to make trade. We're going to bring back our jobs. We're bringing them back. And we're going to have our greatest people but we're bringing them back. We have the greatest negotiators. We're bringing our jobs back from China, many of them. I want to see Apple computers made in the United States. What good does it do when they're made in China? What good does it do? And we have to get them to stop devaluing their currency. And remember this, we have the cards, because we have this pot of gold. That's not such gold anymore, by the way. You know, we owe China $1.7 trillion. We owe Japan $1.5 trillion. How about Japan? They make cars, biggest boats I've ever seen. They come pouring off these massive boats from Japan, just pouring. We give them practically nothing. You talk about trade. They do these cars. You've never seen ships like this, so big. I was in Los Angeles recently, and the cars are pouring off the ships from Japan. So they sell us millions of cars. We sell them like nothing. We give them nothing by comparison. Where's the fairness there, folks? We need to bring smartness back to our country. We need to bring negotiation back to our country. We need to bring honesty back to our country. We need to get deals that are great. We have to bring our manufacturing back. Uh, recently, a friend of mine ordered the Komatsu tractors from Japan. He's always ordered a big excavator, big company. He always orders Caterpillar. But he said, I couldn't do it. He felt badly. I could see. I said, what's your problem? He said, I feel guilty because I ordered Komatsu tractors. They're from Japan. He said, Donald, they've so devalued the yen that I owed it to myself and my family, my wife. I owed it to my employees. 
to buy. I bought it for much cheaper. What's the difference in the equipment? He said, Caterpillar's better, but not that much. I mean, I, I, can't, I had no choice. He said, so he bought Komatsu equipment. Well, that's what's happening to us. We're being outsmarted by very smart people, and we don't have the people. It's like uh, the New England Patriots playing some high school football team. We don't have, we don't have the people in place. We don't have the right people that are doing this. This is like a great surgeon. This is like, you need somebody that's incredible. This is not easy stuff. These people have it naturally. When I take Carl Icahn, I say, Carl, take a look at the Chinese trade deal. I got the greatest guy. You understand that. I mean, and he doesn't want money. He doesn't want it. He'd love to do it. I mean, he'd love to do it. So we're going to make a lot of changes if we get in. We're going to make our country rich again. A woman came up to me. She said, Mr. Trump, that doesn't really sound nice. I said, look, $19 trillion. We just made that horrible omnibus budget. You saw that deal. It took like two hours. They, I never saw a deal go so fast. Obama got everything he wanted. You know, Obama's a lousy negotiator, except when it comes to negotiating with the Republicans. Is that right? He's a terrible negotiator. But with the Republicans, he gets whatever he wants. You look at it. He got, in that deal, he got so much. He got money to bring in the migrants from Syria, who we can't take, because we don't know who they are, where they are, where they come from. We'll do a safe zone, and we'll have the Gulf states pay for it. Not us. We don't want to pay. But we'll have the Gulf states. They're not putting up any money. They have so much money. Saudi Arabia makes a billion dollars a day when the oil price was high. Now they make half, okay? Not so bad. But... And think of Saudi Arabia. We protect Saudi Arabia. They were making a billion dollars a day. They have more money than anybody. And we lose money. I mean, we rent military areas. We pay them rent. And without us, they would have been gone years ago. I mean, who's thinking about this? Japan, we protect Japan. OK. But here's the problem. So we protect Japan. Lose a fortune, by the way. We protect Japan. If we're attacked, Japan doesn't have to do anything. If Japan is attacked, we have to be in World War III, OK? I mean, who's doing this stuff? So we protect Germany. Germany is a behemoth, an economic behemoth. It's being destroyed by what Merkel has done there, what she has done to Germany. I have friends from Germany. They're leaving Germany. They are leaving Germany. These are people who were so proud a year ago of being, in Ger being German people. They were so proud. They used to brag. I said, are you still proud? Not so proud. They're leaving Germany. They're moving to other countries. What she's done, I don't know what happened to her. I thought she was a terrific leader. And I don't know, maybe she got carried away with herself. I don't know. Tr tr like, tremendous crime. You look at Sweden the other night. Did you see what happened in Sweden the other night? Sweden. Sweden doesn't have crime. They're going around. It's a disaster. You look at Brussels. I was in Brussels 20 years ago. Brussels, beautiful Brussels. It's like an armed camp. They had to cancel New Year's Eve because of horrible, horrible threats of massive crime. We have to get smart, folks. And we can't be so politically correct. Oh, that's not a nice thing to say. That's not nice. And actually, a lot of people, and maybe it happened to a certain extent in New Hampshire, they thought I'd get 27, 28 percent, I ended up getting 36, 37 percent. And I think what happened, a lot of people said, you know, the polar goes up to Trump. Well, would you vote for Trump? No, no, no. But then they get in the booth, I want Trump. <laughs> I want Trump. It's true. We might poll higher. So, so I love this place. I, th I have so many friends that live here, and I have uh, such great relationships here. And I've been here a couple of times where I, I was, you know, at the place I actually played, and it was, it's fantastic. But we have a country that has such potential. We have a country that is so great. We can make it truly, and right now it's got a tremendous headache. And I, I'll tell you, if Hillary Clinton gets in, or this guy Bernie wants to tax you 95 percent, if he gets in, everything's for free, except for the people that have to pay tax. And you know what happens to those people? They leave. It's like the companies. The companies are leaving now because the taxes are too high. My tax plan brings the corporate taxes way down. It has to, because the companies are leaving. When you lose Pfizer, how good a company is Pfizer? They're moving. It's gone. It's, they're in Ireland. They're moving to Ireland. They're moving because the taxes are too high. And they couldn't get their money back in. They moved to get their money. But I'm just saying this. We have tremendous potential as a country. Tremendous. I love this country. I love South Carolina. I love it. I love the people. The people are incredible people. Saturday is so important to get out and vote. We're going to turn it around. And, and believe me, it's we. It's not me. I'm like a messenger. 
this is why. They wrote, last week, the cover of uh, Time magazine wrote the most incredible story. I don't normally say an incredible story. If there's one word, I hate it, right? <laughs> but, but this is the most incredible. They talk about this is a movement that's going on with all of us, with us. Not the Bernie thing. We get far bigger crowds than Bernie. We get everything bigger than Bernie. And Bernie, I think, is going to fizzle because eventually, although it's going to be interesting to see what happens to Hillary with the emails, because she should be, what she did is a disgrace, OK? What she did is a disgrace. <laughs> One thing I liked in the poll that came out, USA Today today, it said I'm leading by a lot. It was a great poll, national poll. And it said I beat Hillary and I beat Bernie very easily and head to head. So that's good. That's good. Always nice to but I do in a lot of polls. But the theme is make America great again. And I tell you, we can make it greater than ever before. And let me just tell you, if I get elected, we're going to start winning again. We're going to win on trade. We're going to win at the border. We're not going to have the Mexican officials going over and seeing the Pope and saying, you know, Donald Trump is a bad person. He's a bad person. He wants to stop people from walking freely across the border. And, and the Pope doesn't know this. I mean, the Pope is told this. I mean, I don't even blame the Mexican officials for trying to get away with it. But I don't think they're going to get away with it, okay? Because we're wise to them. We can't lose $58 billion a year in deficits. So I just say this. We're going to start winning again, and we're going to make America great again. And I appreciate it very much that you're here. I love you people, special people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.